Good afternoon once again to all of you in the room and all of you um, out on the Internet. I'd like to begin the sermon this afternoon, or this message, with full disclosure and a disclaimer. I believe an all-knowing, almighty creator God of the entire universe that fashioned man in his own image and likeness for a grand and eternal plan. That's my disclaimer. To further clarify this disclaimer, I would like to ask you to please note that I stated I believe a creator as opposed to believing in the existence of such a being. While this may seem like a nuance, the distinction between believing a creator and believing in the existence of one may seem like a nuance, but I would like to um, propose to you that there is a huge philosophical gulf between the two. It's a question of whether you believe in the existence of a creator or whether you actually believe him is quite a distinction. Because... One is merely a belief in the existence of something. The other is a be- believing what the Creator actually said and ordering your life after that set of beliefs. I know that taking such a position makes me intellectually challenged and would at best have me expelled from the elite halls of intelligentsia and at worst categorized as, well, being not real smart. I'm okay with that. I've never considered myself to be an intellectual giant. However, I do, in addition to make my disclaimer, I would like you to think about the following facts. Believing that God the Creator has the ability and prerogative to impart divine favor upon individuals and nations does not put me in the company of less intellectually challenged individuals and personalities down through history. And I'm going to give you a couple of, ex- so, a couple of quotes, some of which you're probably familiar with, of individuals who are considered and I believe, rightly so, intellectual giants. Consider this quote. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's from Thomas Jefferson quoting the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson is widely regarded as an intellectual giant, and I know of very few people that would dispute that. Here's another quote. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, notice that, the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly implore his protection and favor. That's from George Washington. Let's try two more. Here's another one. Suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book. And every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there exhibited. What a utopia, what a paradise would that region be? That's from John Adams. So we've got Adams, Washington, and Jefferson. All of which not only believed in a creator... Rather, they believed him. And finally, here is a longer quote by another heavyweight in history. In the beginning of the contest with Britain, we 
when we were sensible of danger, we had daily prayers in this room for divine protection. Our prayers, sir, were heard, and they observed frequent instances of superintending providence in our favor. To that kind providence, we owe this happy opportunity of consulting in peace on the means of establishing our future national felicity. And we have, now, and have we now forgotten that prow- powerful friend? Or do we imagine that we no longer need his assistance? I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth that God governs the affairs of men. Benjamin Franklin, on the occasion of the conference of the establishment of the new Constitution, Constitutional Conference, I think it was called. Today, in the time we share, I would like to explore with you the benefits of believing a beneficent creator. I would like to go down through a list of benefits. There are five explicitly listed by a certain section of Scripture that lists out the benefits of believing, not believing in the existence of one, but rather believing in the benefits that he offers to us. Because too often, I think God is viewed as someone that we, if we believe he exists, must obey and that doing so would be detrimental to our happiness, certainly restricts our ability to behave in in, in a manner that is socially acceptable today. And the benefits are forgotten. And in order for us to be able to contrast those benefits with what is the acceptable culture of today, I'll take you, if you will indulge me, to a a passage of Scripture that I've quoted frequently in past messages because I think it prepares us for looking at the five benefits. Not that they're just five, but we will highlight five of them. Over in Romans chapter 1, here's what happens when we do not or do no longer believe in a creator. Romans chapter 1, I'll begin today in verse 7. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8. First I... Thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So here you had individuals in the city of Rome of all places that were not just believing in the existence of a creator, but rather their faith, their belief in that creator was so exemplary that Paul said, It was being spoken of throughout the whole world at his time. And then in doing that, he drops down, I'll drop down to verse 16, and he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. So here we see, uh, before he talks about what happens when you don't believe, he addresses the fact that believing in a creator is a powerful thing. It enables you to do things that are not normally possible. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And then in verse 18, we have this pivotal scripture. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. There has been a systematic suppression of truth, which has brought us to the place we are at as a nation and to a certain extent as individuals and as a church today because we as individuals are influenced by the culture around us. We view things differently today than we did 50 years ago, for example, because of the culture in which we live. We have been, become accustomed to behaviors that 50 years ago would not have been acceptable. It's just a matter of how things work. <clears throat> but when you contrast what we're about to read and also the culture we observe every day and what is coming out of the educational institutions and from intellectuals speaking today compared to the quotes we read from arguably some of the most intelligent individuals um, of their time and ours. The contrast is stark. We have gone from a nation where belief in God was self-evident truth to a nation in which lawsuits are filed. I heard another one on the radio coming up here this morning where a school took a field trip to um, a faith-based organization and they're getting sued. You know... You, you ask yourself, how is that possible? But it is. For the reasons that we read here in verse 19, because what may have been known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse." Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. I mean, this is a statement that is just simply a truism today. We see some of the most foolish decisions and behaviors imaginable being praised as being progressive, um, moving forward, and um, being praised as being righteous. Now let's go take a look at the benefits over in Psalms chapter 103. Psalms chapter 103. I think it is important for us to recognize that the culture in which we live is uh, corrupt, negative, and ungodly. However, it is probably more important for us to recognize the positive benefits of believing God, otherwise we become discouraged. So let's take a look at what we find here in this very concise Psalm of David. I'm just going to read verses 1 through 5 quickly, and then we'll go back and mine the benefits that are listed here. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. So David is commanding himself from his most innermost being to recognize and to bless the Lord. I mean, it wasn't even a question. It was like with Jefferson and Franklin and Washington and Adams. It was self, the the existence of God was self-evident truth. 
It doesn't even come into his vocabulary to question whether or not it is so. Verse 2, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, like I said, there are many benefits, but I would like to focus our attention today on the five that he lists in the next two verses. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. Now, this is a a passage of Scripture that is widely recognized and repeated. And um, actually, I remember hearing this psalm from my my youngest days. I could probably still quote it to you in German because that's how I was taught this psalm. It's kind of like the 123rd psalm that everybody kind of knows and has heard, and it 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 has a very poetic ring to it you know you have a you you look at the the literary construction um of the verses we just read and it's poetic but do we grasp the benefit let's take a look at the five and let's begin with number 1 number 1 is found in verse 3 bless the lord o my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities? The first benefit in believing a beneficent creator is the belief and the benefit of knowing that he is capable of and wants to forgive all your iniqui- iniquities. Now, you know, what does that do for an individual? I mean, that puts you in a position to deal effectively with guilt. You know, there are are, um, different ways of believing and dealing with guilt. You know, guilt is good. It's a mechanism that is designed to get you to think about your situation and lead you to repentance. I mean, of course, we... The other way of dealing with guilt is to not acknowledge that you're doing anything wrong, and most people work that way. I mean, guilt? I mean, I'm guilty? You know, so you go to a counselor, and uh, they make you feel good by telling you you really didn't do anything wrong. And, uh, I mean, I'm not um, trying to be negative on counselors. Counselors can be very effective. I'm talking about the wrong type of counseling. So you never have a, the benefit of really dealing with your situation. I was on the phone um, earlier this week with a, a, an individual working for a company in Germany that we were dealing with, and um, he had not answered my request for a conversation for a couple of weeks, and... He told me, he said, John, I kind of have a guilty conscience. Because he had been traveling in a way and hadn't, hadn't read his email. And I said, well, that's a good thing. You know, if you didn't have a guilty conscience, <laughs> I would be really concerned. And he thought that was funny. Um, so it, because it, it, it showed that he, you know, he cared. Let's go to... Psalms chapter 51. And notice David in his own words talking about this benefit. The benefit of forgiveness following real repentance. Psalms chapter 51. We'll just read through this particular passage because I think it speaks volumes about this particular issue. And this was written according to the um, heading by David to the chief musician after he had been confronted by Nathan the prophet after committing adultery with Bathsheba 
and subsequently murder, having her husband murdered. It doesn't get much worse than that. Verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions. You see, here was the great difference between David and Saul, between David and so many other people down through time. He acknowledged his sin. When Nathan came to him and confronted him regarding the situation after David had had a, a, a had concocted a elaborate cover-up scheme, his answer was very simply, I have sinned and done evil in the sight of the Lord. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part you make you will make me to know wisdom. You know, this past um, Pentecost, we, we talked about in the sermon about the power of truth. David recognized that what God wants within us is truth in the inward parts. David was a man after God's own heart that, you know, it, it, you know, the, 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 the wonderful thing about him was you have this huge contrast. I mean, he had the ability to um, do great exploits. And as this situation shows, he also had the capability of failing greatly as well. And what is so wonderful about this particular psalm is it shows... That no matter how grievous our iniquities might be, God is a beneficent God that is quite willing and able to cleanse us upon real repentance, which involves truth in the inward parts. Purge me with isop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. You know, this iniquity, notice how many times the word iniquity comes up. David recognized that he needed the benefit of God forgiving all his iniquities. Continuing, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You know, he goes from requesting cleansing to pleading with God to not take his spirit away from him, because David had experienced firsthand... What happens when the Holy Spirit is taken from, when the spirit of truth, when the power that God gives us through that is taken away? I mean, Saul went from being a man that had God's spirit to a very troubled man that was trying to assuage his conscience and his uh, problems through all kinds of things, including music, to make it go away. So David pleads with God in this psalm that he would not take it away from him. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltedness, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, 
And my mouth shall show forth your praise, for you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. This, O God, you will not despise. This passage is a classic. Because David did and continues to do what he promised God he would do, and that is that he would teach transgressors God's way. And sinners shall be converted to you. You see, again, going back to dealing with guilt, I, as a minister, generally run into two different um, reactions to it. Both of which shall we say, are equally wrong. One may be a little bit easier to deal with. One is, wait a minute, you know, who are you? I mean, come on, I mean, this isn't that bad after all. I mean, I'm not guilty. The other is a unhealthy guilt to the point of depression in which the individual says, I mean, my sin is so grievous and so great that it's not possible for God to forgive me. How would that be possible? This passage of Scripture speaks to individuals like that. Did you kill somebody? Well, no. Well, did you commit adultery and then kill somebody to call it? I mean, like I said, the, the, the sin of David is hard to, it doesn't get much worse, is what I'm trying to say. And yet, David, God was merciful to him and restored him in a powerful way. And in that way, he is able to teach transgressors today his ways of mercy. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Still on this benefit of forgiving our iniquities. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer... Sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. You know, here Paul is writing to the Hebrews about um, Old Testament rituals to cover sin. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is a... Statement of fact, a promise of benefit from a beneficent creator that is pretty substantial. The promise here is that the blood of Christ not only covers sin, the penalty of sin, in a spiritual sense, rather the power of this forgiveness is able to purge our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. So that the normal inhibitions, and you, you, I, I believe, as most scholars do, that Paul wrote Hebrews. Now, the author knew what he was talking about here because Paul, like... David had blood on his hands. That would have uh, understandably justified Paul not being able to serve God effectively because of his past life and crimes, literally, crimes committed. Because of the power of the purging of iniquities and the purging of conscience, Paul was not able to put not, not able to just put that past behind him. 
but to move forward to become the most prolific apostle of the New Testament church. Now, that's a benefit. You see, the thing about God's mercy and his forgiveness and his beneficent nature is that on the one hand, he is a just God against which you cannot argue successfully for self-justification. It just won't work. Knock yourself out. While on the other hand, upon the acknowledgement of sin, he extends, he extends this unbelievable benefit of not only forgiving it, but enabling individuals who truly acknowledge what they have done to go forward in a manner. I mean, Paul, like I said, he, he is more than any of the other 12. I mean, he wrote most of the New Testament and had, one could argue, more influence than any other of the apostles just because of um, how prolific he was. I mean, he, had, he was trained at the feet of Gamaliel, so he had some skill sets. That once he um, got beyond uh, his issues, he was able to, as it says here, to serve the living God in a powerful way. Let's go over to Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. Um, here is a prophecy about the human heart. That, that flies in the face of current secular humanism as it is widely believed and taught. The heart, Jeremiah writes, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You and God. But what this shows is, in contrast to the belief that human beings are basically good. Now, of course, I mean, there is, there isn't, as is often the case, there is an element of truth in that statement. I mean, there is a certain human goodness um, that is, shall we say, skin deep, that um, can be exhibited by individuals, but human beings, according to this passage, I mean, when it comes right down to the heart of it, the heart is deceitful and wicked. There is an inherent um, inclination towards behavior that is inconsistent with what would benefit human beings. That's the contradiction. Um, we are inclined to do what um, is to our detriment. I, um, I, I should have brought it with me, brought it up here with me. I've got it laying back on the table. I bought a book, a little tiny book that's the um, 1758 um, Introduction to Poor Richard's Almanac, in which Benjamin Franklin invented a character called Father Abraham to quote himself. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful piece of literature, literature just to read because it is a brilliant construction. And so Father Abraham proceeds to tell the people of his audience, an imagined audience, uh, about all the... Uh, benefits of frugality that poor Richard had over the years quoted. And then what, what, what the, the conclusion of the story goes like this, that the old man ended his harangue, um, which is an interesting choice of words in itself, and 
the people believed his doctrine. I mean, the people said, we believe it. I mean, this is great wisdom. And then proceeded to do exactly the opposite. And then Franklin adds just a wonderful, he said, like an ordinary sermon. I I thought that was uh, a timeless piece of wisdom, you know, we, we acknowledge the truth. It is wonderful to do these things, and we hear a great sermon. And then what we do, we practice the opposite. Hence, we need the first benefit here enumerated in Psalm 103. Let's go back to Psalm 103 and take a look at the next benefit. And I, like you, should put a marker in Psalm 103 because we'll keep coming back here three more times. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who heals all your diseases. Is that a benefit? You know, we talk about benefits. You know, today when we talk about employee, employer-employee relationships, you know, one of the discussions, there are two primary discussions. How much do I get paid? And what are the benefits? Well, I mean, you have the benefit of working, right? I mean, what more do you need? No, I mean, the, the benefits today are the expectation is that there's a vacation, that there are paid holidays, and then what's the big one? Health care benefits. What David is saying here is the he's, he's telling his soul to not forget the benefit of healing that God offers to those who would believe him. And I think we in this room can all attest to the fact that that is a great benefit and that we have witnessed it. God is the divine healer. I mean, I've always found it interesting. You know, when we have medical science and it's a wonderful uh, thing that we've got and the, the, the things that medical science can do today is astonishing in many cases. But when it gets to the point where somebody is on life support and we've got every contraption, technical contraption imaginable attached to the individual and we've pumped him or her full of whatever substances we have at our disposal to try to sustain life, at the end of the day, what, what is said? Well, you know, we've done what we can. It's up to God. At the end, there is, in many cases, still that acknowledgement. What, what David is saying here, and I think the message to us is that we should not wait until we get to that state to make that acknowledgement, but rather we should not forget his benefit of healing when we are still healthy and, well, take steps um, in order to prevent disease to the extent that we can. Let's go over to Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. And he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, if you do all of that, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So here we have this benefit given by God very early. I mean, this is, this is very early in God's direct intervention and relationship with uh, the nation of Israel as he's taken them out of Egypt. And he said, look, I mean, if you do, if you heed my commandments, if you 
do all of these things, then my promise to you is that I'm not going to put on you all the diseases that you experienced and saw in Egypt. And the remarkable thing is there are studies that have been done and there are books out there that the interesting thing is that there is nothing new under the sun that the Egyptians, when they... I mean, they they did a good job of mummifying and preserving bodies that can today be studied. And, you know, they had cancer and, you know, another passage in the Old Testament lists some of those, what some of those diseases were. It really wasn't that different from what we experience today. One of the benefits to believing a beneficent creator is not just that he heals when we're sick, but rather that his laws and commandments define a way of life that is beneficial and healthy if we heed it. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Here we have uh, Deuteronomy chapter one, uh, 28 is one of the of two chapters in the Old Testament that lists blessings and cursings. So here we will break into the thought. This is the these are some of the curses of disobedience. In verse 15 we say, but it it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his statutes and commandments which I command you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. And then there's a list. We drop down to verse 27. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors. Ever heard of a tumor? with the scab and with the itch from which you cannot be healed. And the Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of heart. And you shall grope at noonday as a blind man gropes in darkness. You shall not prosper in your ways and you shall only be oppressed and plundered continually and no one shall save you. You see... Part of the benefit of believing God is that we will live a life that just by natural law and consequence will prevent us from getting ourselves into some of the troubles that individuals who completely ignore it get themselves into. Blessing and cursing is largely cause and effect. And it doesn't mean we don't get sick. It doesn't mean, it does not mean that every time we get sick, it is the result of um, a life that's not well lived. We live and are affected by the culture in which we live. But I think any thinking person will also acknowledge that, and medical science um, supports this, that if we live a healthy lifestyle, the probability of us getting sick is greatly reduced. That's just on a physical level. Let's go now to um, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern, have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ 
whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. <laughs> that is an interesting... Your belly is your God? You know, what do we eat? What do we drink? And what dictates what we eat and drink? Well, you know, what he's talking about is lust, greed. We we tend to, you know, what is the proverb? What is sweet to the tongue is bitter to the stomach. You know, what is, you know, you, you have all those goodies in the exit aisles of the grocery store, you know, if we would just shop the outer walls of the grocery store, we would get healthier um, automatically. You ever notice what they have at the at the checkout? You know, you, you all those things that you look there and you say, mm. and you know what? The, you know what the the problem is. You're standing there, right? I mean, when when you're going around the outside of the grocery store, you're pushing a cart, right? You're moving, and there are there's the milk and the oranges and the grapefruits and the vegetables and the salads and all of those things. You you can just roll right by it, and then you drive your cart to the checkout line, and what do you look? On this side, and that side. My belly just became my God. Now, Paul didn't think it was a good thing. He said, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he makes a connection. Who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. According to Paul, these people that he was talking about allowed their God to their belly to become their God to their own destruction. And that can happen. You know, gluttony Gluttony is listed in the sin list of the New Testament. I know sin is one of those unpopular words. Um, uh, maybe we should call it an addictive behavior uh, to be a little bit more kind. Um, it's when our, guy, when, when our belly dictates what our mind should dictate. Now, I don't really need the bag of potato chips that's I mean <clears throat> I don't really need the and of course the kids uh, they work on them really early too I mean the the box of candy that's sitting right there at the checkout line where you're standing your, your cart is parked James chapter 5 James chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 13 through 16 because I think it is important that we recognize and see how this promise is packaged in a particular context. Verse 13, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? So here you have a list. Is anyone suffering? Is anyone is anyone cheerful? Is anyone among you sick? And then it answers the question of what to do. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So that's the action step. And it is something that we practice and believe. But notice what how the context continues. And it says, the prayer of faith will save the sick 
and the Lord will raise him up. Notice that this is not, this is written in the affirmative. It says that the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. It's not a question of if, but a question of when. I mean, even, even if some, someone, as we all do, ultimately dies, the promise and the prayer of faith will ultimately be answered because we believe that God will raise them up. So it's really a, only a question of when. Continuing, another and. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. So there is, or let me, let me back up, there can be a connection between sin and sickness, mentally or physically. I said there can be. It doesn't mean that there is. The, again, this is the question of balance because... You know, you have, you, you, I mean, I've seen a situation where people are sick. They've done everything that they could possibly do. And they might have a genetic predisposition uh, for a particular sickness. I mean, it's just, unfortunately, a consequence with which they have to live and has nothing to do with sinful behavior. But the fact that that is so in some cases does, should not and will not excuse those of us who do not take care of our bodies and then suffer the consequence. But even then, it says that that sin will be forgiven us. Continuing, notice the context. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You see, we often lift the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much out of the context to make a point, when in actuality it is in connection with and in the context of healing and the confession of trespasses to one another. I find that to be remarkable because sometimes, oftentimes rather, Effective change begins to happen when you find yourself what is called in modern terminology an accountability partner who says, John, you know, did you exercise today? The answer is no, I didn't. And when you learn how to solve that problem for me, it's worth a lot. I exercise a lot going up and down stairs and doing all kinds of things, but... Um, Change often happens when there is what is described here, a confession of trespasses with someone that you trust that can be that extra voice of accountability to get you to um, make the changes in your life that you know you need to make. It's a great benefit. It's a benefit that David said urged his soul to bless and remember. Let's go back to Psalm chapter 113 and look at the next one. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who redeems your life from destruction. I mean, that sounds ominous. And if, if we are destined for destruction and 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 God, like David, says that we should remember that God redeems us or can redeem us from that. That is a big benefit, is it not? Redeems your life from destruction. You know, how how is that done? I mean, does, does God just kind of come and pick you up, you know, and lift you up? Well... Possibly, but I, I, I'd like to, I mean, there are many ways that I could demonstrate in a time we share how that is done, but I'd like to look at Ephesians chapter 6 because I think it provides a um, practical example 
of a life redeemed from destruction. And perhaps, I mean, you haven't thought of Ephesians chapter 6 as a an example of redemption from destruction. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 1 says this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment was promised, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. You know, there is a prevention or a redemption depending on at what stage in your life you embrace this truism. It says here that children should obey their parents and honor their father and mother, for it is the first commandment was promised that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. Now, children that that do that at an early age and continue it throughout their lifetimes they're invariably redeemed from destruction. You know, when you have the tumultuous teen years, as they are called, and they don't need to be that, where there is rebellion, in many cases, because of what we read, let me read the next verse, and you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up into training and admonition of the Lord. I mean, Teenage rebellion is often the result of either provocation by parents or the lack of appropriate discipline and training. But whatever the case may be, the redemption from destruction occurs when the children align themselves with the commandments, there we use the word, Honor your father and mother. You see, God is not... God, while he is able and sometimes does, just reach down and protect someone in dramatic ways and redeems their life from destruction, saves them from a horrible accident. That is not generally how it occurs. There are laws in motion that if we believe a beneficent creator that create a um, scenario that produces this benefit of redemption from from destruction. Continuing in in, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. Now, he's speaking to uh, the Ephesians, in this case, the church at Ephesus, in a culture in which servitude was um, still practiced. And what is he he saying? I mean, here's how you redeem yourself from destruction. Not with eye service as man pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. So Paul's instruction, Paul's um, initiative of showing individuals how to redeem themselves from destruction and you know if you were a servant whether bond or free you would benefit and save yourself from destruction by serving your master as if you were serving Christ and here is a little dynamic and I believe you can I mean we live in a very different culture today but I believe the principle of being the best you can be and serving undeserving quote-unquote masters or bosses in the manner that is described here will not only redeem you from destruction, getting fired, for example, but it will have, it, it, it creates a dynamic that just works. It says here, 
with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. The promise here is, the spiritual component of this is that somehow, in some way, God will give you what is due. Verse 9, And you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So here he, he starts to get to the real issue and the cause. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And then he gives us additional concrete examples on how we can redeem ourselves from destruction. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breast plate of righteousness. Notice the order. Beginning with truth, moving on to righteousness, and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you are able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. We are to fight for our redemption that God promises us as a benefit. Back to Psalms chapter 103. Psalms chapter 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. A crown? Of mercy? A crown of loving kindness? Is that a benefit? Let's look at Second Timothy chapter four. Second Timothy chapter four. Verse eight. Here we have Paul writing to Timothy from Nero's prison in Rome. This was the benefit that Paul um, received or expected to receive in verse 8. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. That sounds like a benefit. But we have this word and again. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You see how seamlessly the list that David wrote in the psalm as a king of the Old Testament flows and connects with the concluding um, message of Paul just prior to his execution. First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five. Verse two. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers not by constraint, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, verse 4, and when the chief shepherd appears, 
you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Revelation chapter 2, in verse 10. Revelation chapter 2 in verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. Everybody that has served God down through time, the one thing they all have in common is they died. And so will you and I. But beyond that, the benefit that is described in Psalm chapter 103 extends beyond this life however beneficial or troublesome it might be right now. Finally, let's look at number five. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like an eagle. go over to Mark. Let's go over to Mark and notice a scripture because, again, like I said, I think it is important for us to focus on the benefits that God offers to us instead of what is also the case, the challenges we face. Mark chapter 10 I'm going to pick it up in um, let me see here verse 28 then Peter began to say to him see we have left all and followed you so Peter is either wanting to impress Jesus Christ with, you know, all that he had given up. Or maybe he's kind of bemoaning the fact, you know, he gave up all this to follow him. In verse 29, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the Gospels. I mean, that's Quite a list. Who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time? Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. So, I mean, it's um, a realistic balance. And in the age to come, eternal life. Here you have Jesus Christ confirming, I think, in a, in a very uh, detailed manner, the promise of the benefit that David noted in Psalm 103. Satisfies your mouth with good things, and youth is restored. We conclude back in Psalms chapter 37 with a passage that I have found to be true as David did. In Psalm chapter 37, it is entitled The Heritage of the Righteous and the Calamity of the Wicked. Here is, in verse 25, kind of a concluding statement Um, or a summary statement 
is perhaps putting it more accurately, by David. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. Have any of you seen that? I don't think so. Because if we had someone in our midst in that situation, the brethren would come to his or her aid. We conclude with Psalm chapter 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, and satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like an eagle's. That, brethren, is a list of the benefits of believing a beneficent creator.